بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي لا يخشى الدوائر والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين محمد الأمين. So today I want to talk about a very important subject. Uh, we will be going over uh, this book written by the great scholar uh, of Radu al-Mukhtar, which is a very famous uh, book of Islamic jurisprudence. But this is the Encyclopedia of Hadith Forgeries. And it's a translation done by this very, very great scholar, mashallah. And I want to discuss the points that he makes in this about Hadith Forgeries. Now, why, why do I want to do this? Uh, there are many reasons why I want to do this, because there are a lot of people who object to the Hadith sciences. And those of us that are interested in connecting Quran with the Hadith uh, have to be aware of, especially those of us that are interested in the end times, we have to be aware of what we have to be uh, look we have to look out for when we are dealing with the sayings of the Prophet. Also to give us an appreciation of the work done in the past the level of work that has been done in uh, being able to categorize and see the forgeries and also in understanding of how the process of history worked. Uh, so this is a very important subject because it places the Hadith science and the idea is to place the Hadith sciences in the right place. Uh, and so inshallah, I'm hoping inshallah I will be able to accomplish that. I don't know how long I'm going to talk. I'm basically not going to go over all 700 pages. Maybe I'll have a separate session one day in which I just go over the narrations themselves that are known to be uh, forgeries. <clears throat> but today I want to talk about the main categories of the forgeries. Okay. And so, you know, there's about, uh, I can say maybe about 30 to 40 different categories in which Hadith forgery has taken place. Uh, and so with that, inshallah ta'ala, I hope this becomes beneficial for everyone. Uh, you know, one of the brothers in one of the telegram groups sent this over and I was like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. This is one of the things that we needed in our times. It's a very valuable uh, book um, that could be very helpful even for the or Orientalists. Uh, who question hadith it can be very valuable even for the Qurani Yun, those people who deny completely deny the hadith sciences. And you know the Quran says, In Ja'akum Fasikum binaba in fatabayanu. If a fasik, some evil doer comes to you, make it clear. Right? And there's no naba, there's no news that's more important than saying the Prophet said this. So it has to be made clear. And it has to be made clear from the perspective is this person telling a lie? Or is this person telling the truth? And so, inshallah, let's continue. So, inshallah, I hope this will not be boring. This is extremely important for students of knowledge to know some of the things that Qari Mullah Ali Rahim, Rahimullah mentions in this uh, enormous book of his. And so, I'm going to try to summarize the beginning part of this, the first like 200 pages, I think. And we'll go over a lot of things, at least in summary, you should know this. And these are some things that even many of the scholars are not completely aware of. And so you'll have a certain advantage. I might teach certain terminologies that are very important, that if you're aware of, then that will be helpful to you also. So like I said, this book is written by uh, uh, Mullah Ali Qari. Uh, we should do dua for him. And the translator uh, Gabriel Fuad Haddad, who has translated many, many great books, many, many great books uh, into the English language, including this awesome work that he's done. I hope everyone does dua for both of them in order to benefit from them, do dua for them. Okay, and then this is sayings attribu misattributed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So with this, let's begin. So let me start by this quotation. It is the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way of the upright caliphs after him to fend off false reports from his sunnah, exposing whoever conveys them and showing the liars fraud so that one can be safe from 
persecution by the messenger of Allah because Allah, the Prophet will persecute meaning he will be a prosecution witness against you if you said something the Prophet didn't say so it's a very very serious matter which people take very lightly nowadays whoever narrates from the Prophet a single false hadith and persists, persists in its false attribution the Prophet himself shall be his persecutor on the day of judgment this is what the Prophet said and this is written by who? None other than Darul Qutni, Rahimullah. Okay. All the scholars agree that no Muslim is allowed to say the Messenger of Allah said this or that until one has acquired the actual narration of that hadith. Over here, I'll mention that one thing the scholars say in order to not to to protect themselves. So if you're not hundred percent sure, you say. At the end of mentioning the hadith, أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم, or as the Prophet said, this statement that I made that he said such and such. So, for example, إنما الأعمال بالنيات, indeed actions are by intentions. إنما الأعمال بالنيات, أو كما قال صلى الله, or however the Prophet made that statement. It, it's exact words. I may not have remember, but أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. So all scholars agree that no Muslim is allowed to say. The Messenger of Allah has said this or that until one has acquired the actual narration of that hadith. Even in the remotest sense of a qualified narration due to what the Prophet said, whoever knowingly attributes a lie to me, let him know, let him now take his soul, let him now take his seat in the hellfire. And this is from Qari Mullah Ali's introduction of his book, this one that we're going to go over. So the first thing I want to go over is what Imam Ibn Habban's 20 types of unreliable narrators. Okay, so 20 types of unreliable narrators. The first time are heretics. What, do, what, do, what does he mean? These are people who actually accepted Islam for the purpose of sabotaging Islam. Okay, and in this are the devil worshippers, because when we're talking about end of times and how they have worked uh, very, very hard from their side to discredit the Prophet وسلم, to discredit uh, and then these narrations that discredit the Prophet وسلم, today are being taken up by Orientalists and others and those people who deny hadith and then say, see the Prophet said this because number one, they don't understand how hadith sciences work. Number two, they get influenced by those narrations that we already know are weak but the reason that they have been written is to say that yes, we saw this and we know this and we've testified to its falsehood. And so and the first group of people are those people that have been caught through various procedures that these are not people who had good intentions towards Islam. Okay, and so let me just uh, read what Imam Ibn, uh, Ibn Habban's 20 types of unreliable narrators. The first type are heretics. They did not believe in Allah and the last day. They would enter the, the cities and pretend to be scholars, fostering forgeries on the ulama and narrating forgeries from them in order to instill, instill skepticism and doubt in the hearts of the common public. But they were caught then and they have been caught now, but it's just not talked about enough. Some trustworthy narrators may in turn narrate from them un unwittingly because they pretend to be scholars and they wear the garb of the scholars and so some sincere Muslims might take from them without realizing that they're taking from them and this is why there's a whole system in place convey to them uh, pros uh, posterity so they would convey it to the people afterwards ensuring those narrations are in the mainstream over here one thing i want to mention if something didn't get changed then for example Constantinople, constantinople so that didn't change it remained const so then they changed the name of Constantinople to istanbul or islambol islambol to istanbul okay so shaitan has been working like this and we have to be aware how shaitan has been working on the hadith literature from different sides in order to uh, to to have his effect. Okay. The second type are those who fell victim to shaitan to the point they forged hadith and attributed them 
to the trustworthy authorities in order to sound more convincing in motivating others to do good deeds, mentioning excellent deeds, exhorting them to stay away from sins, all the time thinking they're doing good for which they will be rewarded. So there was a group of people, and I'll just give you an example of this in today. Maybe a lot of you have seen people when they first become religious, and maybe you're one of them, but you know, you're really zealous and you're really willing to go, you know, above and beyond to make things right. And in that state, some people will say, well, the prophet said this. Well, Islam says this. And, you know, the prophet said this. And they would say, no, you have to do this good deed. And so the prophet, you know, and you will then exaggerate to the point the exaggeration almost becomes like a lie. And there's a lot of exaggeration in the Hadith literature, okay, which uh, Qari Mullah Ali uh, refers to over and over again. And we're going to be talking about that today. Okay, so those people who had good intentions, but they, they made it seem like the Prophet said it or the Prophet did it, and they made, they tried to make it into a sunnah because they felt it was so important to do. Okay. Uh, the third type deliberately and uh, four chains of transmission and texts which they attributed to trustworthy authorities as saying the messenger of Allah a typical forger will stay up at night inventing forgeries and fabrications so the first group the second group the, the previous group I just mentioned these were people who had good intentions but they were doing something terrible this is a group of people that actually took it as a skill that how can we make a chain of narrations? And what would they do? You know, they, they would use the name of an authority that is not questionable, right? Like, who is going to lie about Abu Huraira said this? Like, that's a big deal. Who's going to lie? Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud or Ibn Umar or Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu majma'in that, that he said this and this. And so they would, they would get a chain of narrations that looks to the person at that time because he knows the people oh he said oh, okay that looks pretty reliable you know and so they would forge these at night they would stay awake okay at night uh and then they would uh bring them to the people as false narrations the third type deliberately afford narration transmission and texts which they attributed to the trustworthy authorities as saying the message as sayings of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam a, a typical forger will stay up at night inventing and fabricating his forgeries because you didn't only have to, you had to come up with the best way to say it, right? Because the Prophet is Afsahul Arab. And so you have to come up with the best way to say it. And then you have to come up with a chain of narrations in that time, especially the first 300 years. You have to come up with a chain of narrations that sounds true, that looks true that looks believable particularly from the perspective where this person lives and where he's coming from so he has to come with a chain of narrations that has to do with his location the fourth type forged hadiths only on special occasions okay so these are forged hadiths basically a special occasions or events had mostly to do with uh making the sultan of the time happy or the caliph happy or you know uh, trying to say the prophet said this about you this was the prophet saying this about his prediction about you right and statements like that where um forgeries were made uh in in special events special battles uh special occasions in in order to appeal to the authorities and this is something that's very constant okay uh, there are many, many examples of this. And the opposite example of that is also there. Like, so for example, as you know, Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhumah, they were killed. So any of the narrations that were coming from them, they would not mention the name of Ali or Hassan Hussein because it would be a problem for the government. And so in some cases, they omitted this, which was is considered not a good thing to omit somebody from the chain of narrations but Imam Malik accepted it especially if it was from Hassan Basri and if Hassan Basri said the Prophet said this and Hassan Basri is getting it from Ali but he's not going to mention Ali because of the political situation but then there's the opposite of that where is that people were taking advantage of the political situation making things up to get closer to the Sultan okay again what is the purpose of this is to show you that 
they really took hadith seriously and the scrutiny of hadith literature was taken very very seriously and they are they didn't only look at okay let's look at this chain of narrations it's sahih you're going to see it's very very detailed very very comprehensive and this is what i wanted to show the brothers and sisters the fifth type were overall pious worshippers who were unconcerned with memorization and discernment oh did the prophets use this word or use this word you know they didn't really memorize they just kind of like heard it and then just forwarded what they remember of what they heard with even some changes in the words right even though the prophet uh the prophet's companions would sometimes not narrate in fear of they're not going to say it exactly the way the prophet said it or if the prophet made a certain gesture while saying it and if they weren't sure that they would they would not be able to make the gesture the, the way he did it or if the prophet emphasized a certain word they would be scared that they they're not going to emphasize that word in the exact way the prophet said it and so they would not narrate narrations and on the other side you had people who were pious and they wanted to teach and they wanted to express and but they didn't do it with the scrutiny of scholarship they just did it as muslims so whatever they narrated something they would attribute to the prophet what he did not say or connect disconnected chains of transmission reversing their order and mistaking the sermons of hassan for example for hadith narrated from anas from the prophet so they would say hassan said this even though anas said it you know and to this to to a normal muslim what does it matter as long as the prophet said it but it matters at a scholarly level at the level of the academics at the level of hadith sciences it mattered okay their narrations were no longer considered proof so such people whose transmission of narration did not fit, fit, fit the text and uh then that was not acceptable okay the sixth type are a group of trustworthy narrators who became senile in their old age to the point they no longer knew what they were saying yet they answered whoever questioned them and narrated in any way they liked their sound narrations became mixed with their unsound ones without difference consequently they deserve to be abandoned so let's say there's a muhaddis all his life he's been you know uh, mentioning hadith and now all of a sudden uh, he is old and uh, let's say you know a type of memory loss has happened and uh, people are asking he's he's you know in that role from ages now he's going to answer the question but the muhaddisin as a group of scholars said no because now the good and the bad have been mixed it's better just to stay away from what he has to say because there was already enough chain of narrations for everything that was really needed out there that you didn't have to really rely on somebody who'd become uh, senile even though there is a lot of hadith discussion about certain even companions certain people you know did he really become senile did he not really become senile you know did do are they able to make a distinction between the narrations that he mentioned in the early part of his life versus when he was older if you know so these things are uh things people talk about but uh, but uh, but but uh, ibn habban uh in his uh criteria as you can see here he said if somebody became senile then that's it there's no need to even look at that there's no need to even go into uh you know can we make a distinction between the old and the young and so on and so forth seventh type are those who did not care what they narrated or what they were told was uh, what they were told was their own transmissions whenever they were told this is from your transmissions they would transmit without having memorized it first such narrators no longer pro, uh, because they they lie without realizing it so in other words these were people uh who did not care about they 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 would say the prophet said this but they didn't care about the transmission of narration okay and then they would get all that mixed up and they weren't able to say the right near because that that was one of the main things do you really know the hadith sciences okay then tell us who are the narrators you know where did you get this from exactly right asanid min ad-din the asanid they are part of the deen of islam there's no islam without asnad without chain of narrations there's no islam and so you needed that and so the eighth type are those who lie unintentionally unwittingly simply because they are not a people of learning and have no idea what learning is 
uh, even though Imam uh, Ibn Habban mentions this, but I want to mention something very important. Most of the hadith literature has to do with scholars. It doesn't have to do with people listening to, for example, Jummah khutbas or some halaqa. Just because you went to a halaqa doesn't mean you can start narrating hadith on behalf of the Prophet with the chain of narrations. No. Even though some people did that, they were identified and said, well, this guy is not really a scholar, so we're not really going to take from him. Right? Otherwise, everyone will be narrating. Right? Even though the number of actual people narrating, in the complete number of people narrating was less than 60,000 probably. And less than a few hundred companions of the Prophet, less than 300 were narrating uh, anything at all. And majority of it was done by the, you know, the first 40. Right? And... Uh, so they were very, the companions of the Prophet were very careful who was narrating on behalf of the Prophet. And uh, those people who would narrate on behalf of a scholar because they were sitting with him or they heard something from him, that didn't qualify them to actually narrate it just because they heard it. So that was something that was understood in those early times and uh, in, that, in that early society. Just because you heard a narration in a, in a Jummah khutbah, that's not the proper studying and the proper format, you know, is that you have to, like for example, in the case of Imam Malik, you would have to read back the Muwatta, the whole transmission of each and every person in every chain of narration, you would have to read that back and you would have to know who these people were. That And they were all scholars, okay? And mostly they were all scholars. Um, eighth type are those who lie unintentionally, unwittingly, simply because they're not a people of learning. They have no idea what learning is. They don't know who's from... Iraq and who's from you know from Medina and they don't know which narrators are from which place and so they you know the ninth type are those who narrated sound texts from those that they never met okay although the written texts were sound nevertheless the audition of them never took place and they may not even have seen those they narrate from hence they deserve to be abandoned so an example of this is let's say it was very hard but there were instances where you got the writings of the Musannif of such and such person or the Sahifa of such and such person books or written material of, let's say, such and such uh, person who was a well-known scholar and then you narrated on his behalf as if he had actually told you and if that was proven that this person actually never met that person, well, then even if he's narrating from his writings because we don't know what that person's opinion is about his own writings. So unless he you know, taught it to a student who then taught it to somebody else, somebody who is, like today, I can take a hadith and say, the Prophet said this because I'm relying on somebody who said the Prophet said this, right? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nowadays it's okay. But in the olden days it was not okay to do that because only scholars, and this started really from the time of Umar radiallahu anh, only scholars were allowed to narrate narrations. And Omar radiallahu anh forbade the public from just mentioning, oh, the Prophet said this and the Prophet said this. Um, the tenth type are those who reversed the hadith and readjusted the tra tra chain of transmissions, narrating disclaimed reports and other things from famous narrators who never narrated them in the first place. So these are people who... Uh, uh, reversed the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. And you can tell when you take the stronger narration versus this not very strong narration and you see the order is mixed up so that would be just thrown away. Okay? Or kept for record just to say that it's been thrown away. Okay? Eleven type are those who saw the shaykhs and heard from them specific narrations. So now this is a person who is a student of knowledge. He's going to the halaqa. He's actually met the scholar, actually heard from him. After those shaykhs died, they heard that they had also narrated other sayings, which they proceeded to memorize as well. They narrated the latter as if they had heard them directly when they had not. So this is now the 11th type. The 11th type is that you were a student, you heard X amount of narrations from your teacher, but now he's died, but now you're hearing from one of his other students, and you're not attributing it to the student, or you got it from one of the things that is written down, or you got it or you heard something else in a Jummah khutbah that that same scholar used to sit with and he's saying it, and now you're, oh, okay, yeah, I used to study with him. Okay, so he also says this. You couldn't do that. That would be a, that would be not protecting the sayings of the Prophet, as in you could now not be a source, because now you're mixing between what you were really taught 
versus what you're just hearing. Okay. And so, um, eleventh type of those who saw the sheikh and heard from them specific hadiths after those died, they after the sheikh died, they heard that they had also narrated other hadiths which they proceeded to memorize as well, then narrated the latter as if they had heard them from them. In reality, they never had done that. The twelfth type are those who wrote hadiths and traveled for that purpose. So these are people who are writing hadiths and they're traveling and learning and listening and recording. However, they lost their books for some reason. And when their hadiths were in demand and they narrated out of the other person's books what they had, uh, that they had neither memorized nor heard. Okay, so if you lost your book and other people have your book and you don't know your hadiths, and you don't know your narrations, and you don't know your transmission, that will also be disqualified now. So this is according to Imam Ibn Hibban's criteria. Thirteenth type, I mean, because I would say even as scholar, that, well, as long as you have his book, and he recorded it, and he verified it, if there's a way to, you know, maybe we can accept that. But no, Imam Ibn Hibban says no. Thirteenth type are those who made chronic and abundant mistakes. They deserve to be abandoned, although honest in themselves. So they were honest, but they were careless or clumsy or they were just not meant to do this work. Fourteenth type is someone who was afflicted with an evil son or a bookseller who forged hadiths and attributed them to him. And he trusted them and narrated those hadiths unwilling, unwittingly deserving to be uh, abandoned. So now let's say you're, you're, you're the son of a great scholar and this happened many, many times. You're son of a great scholar the father has died, and now the son is narrating like as if on behalf of the dad when he was never really a student. Or he is trying to sell his books, and for that he's compiled other narrations that his father never narrated, who was a scholar and a muhaddis. Okay, so like I said, a lot of work went into this. Okay, the 15th type are those for whom forgeries were composed, and he narrated them unwillingly. And then uh, are those for whom forgeries were composed and narrated them unwittingly. And then he realized what had happened and neither took them back nor acknowledged his mistake. So another is a group of people that they would narrate thinking it's real. And then when they would be told by other scholars, no, this is not the transmission we have. Then he would realize that, wait, uh, maybe I made a mistake, but then he wouldn't admit the mistake, right? And so those people were abandoned, okay, and that took to that attitude. Um, the 17th type is open, uh, uh, reprobate. Such a person is no longer upright, even if truthful in what he narrates, right? This is a person who is openly going against the Sharia, disobeying the Sunnah of the. I mean, you're learning Hadith and you're doing everything against the Sunnah of the Prophet. Then such a person's narrations would be abandoned. The eighteenth type is the concealer of his sources. Okay, uh, mudallis. But I said, like in the case of Hassan Basri, for example, him not mentioning Ali for political reasons because he would be persecuted. So in that case, for example, Imam Malik would accept it. Right? So you see this is a very, very complicated issue. And so if there is somebody concealing his testimony, right, that uh, when such sources are sheikhs he never saw or heard, uh, how do we know it's, he ever met this person? Right. So in this case, 19th type are the activist innovators who invite others to innovate to the point they become leaders and imams in the religion. So now they want to push some agenda or something to the point where they are saying even the Prophet said this, right? The Prophet said, uh, buying onions will give you this much reward with Allah, for example, because the person is selling onions. The 20th type are storytellers, spongers, and uh, medicants who make up hadiths and attribute them to famous, trustworthy narrators so people would narrate those forgeries from them, okay? So those people that were storytellers, they're especially very prone to this, you know, because when you're telling a story, you're always looking for the spice in the story, right? Can I exaggerate, right? What can I increase in the story to make it look more like important or different? And so that would be a big uh, pitfall for a lot of people. 
So now let's talk about characteristics of the text and how do we know from the looking at not the transmission but looking at the text itself that it is a forgery. Okay. So uh, number one, poor Arabic. Forgers of the mat matun typically have a poor command of prophetic idioms, meaning uh, when you have read enough narrations, the prophet said this, and the prophet said this, and the prophet said this, you get used to the words he uses and the style in which he says those words. And so the people can try to copy the style, but th one thing that's very, very interesting about copying the prophetic style is that if you, if somebody else copies the prophet in the prophet's style, it seems when you study the Hadith literature, if you try to say the same thing the Prophet says uh, in the way the Prophet said, for example, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس يجمعين or لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه or لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى هو أن تبع مما جئت به like for example, this style is one of the prophetic styles of talking. If somebody else tried to copy this with their own interests, it would become very, it, it would be, it wouldn't make as much sense. Let's put it that way. So, the, and the Prophet said about himself, Ana afsahul Arab. I'm the most, the most classical of Arab. Of course, the Quran also calls the Prophet Rasul the the messenger who is clear. He's the most clear in giving the message. That's his job from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has to be the most clear, he has to be Rasul Mubin, the most clear of the of the messengers, right? In what he's trying to convey. So he is the messenger he has to convey, and he's the most clear of those who convey. And so uh if the Arabic is poor, then he's obviously not done his job, which in this case is clearly that's not the case. So forgers of Matun typically have a poor command of the prophetic idiom, which they try to replicate. Hence, an Arabic idiom characterized what masters called rakaka or rika. Okay, that there is a certain lameness in the narration, in the text, in the wordings. Ibn Salah said, "A hadith can be known to be a forgery only through the assertion of its forger." to the effect or something tantamount, but the scholar might also understand something to be forged by the context, the qareen, of the narrator's status or the content of the narration, meaning the content of the narration itself will tell you, did the prophet say this? Is this a prophetic way of saying things? Okay, is this in the best of Arabic language? And especially long hadiths have been forged whose poor language and lame uh, measurings are testimonial to it being forged. Because why? Because the Prophet would be, you know, Jawami'ul Kalam. The Prophet say the most in the least amount of words. So if you see a long narration, you're like, wait, this could have been said in a much better way. The Prophet definitely didn't say this. Right? Or the there's a problem with the grammar or the Arabic language, or it wasn't using exact words the way the Prophet did. Or the, uh, certain words were used in this hadith that have been used in no other narration of the Prophet So the Arabic language itself was a big uh, helper in knowing uh, if in, in the prophetic method of saying things and the Prophet was very consistent on how he would say things. Okay, an example of lameness both in wordings and meaning is the, uh, uh, is the uh, forgery is of narration Allah has made an angel made of stone named Umara who descends on a donkey made of stone every day and fixes the market prices so this is the narration that uh, that has been attributed to the Prophet the, the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah has, send, has, said, has an angel made of stone named Umara who descends on a donkey made of stone every day and fixes market prices this, uh, if you were to look at this in the Arabic language itself, you know, this type of uh, talk is completely unprophetic, okay? Completely against Quran, completely unprophetic, and uh, it doesn't even make sense. And the Prophet never talked in this style, right? So it's very clear that the Prophet did not say this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Copycat effect of forgers attempted re... Uh, Reduplication of the prophetic idioms uh, can produce hilarious results. 
Okay, so trying to say things in the way the prophet said it, and you're trying to duplicate or copycat the prophet, but saying your own stuff can create hilarious results. Eggplant fulfills whatever need it is eaten for. Okay, the, this is forged on the model of the hadith in which the prophet said, Zamzam fulfills whatever need it is drunk for. Okay, so the Zamzam water, the prophet said, whatever you drink Zamzam water for, that is what it is for. So now somebody made another hadith, a false hadith, eggplants were filled whatever need it is eaten for. Okay, so uh, whatever need, uh, so among the reasons of this uh, caricature of the prophetic discourse is that forgers, many of them from non-Arab and non-Muslim cultures, imagine they have a fair enough command of Arabic, which bl blinds them to the fact that they do not understand hadith. Victims of similar delusion today are Orientalists and other products of Western academics, who are clueless of the faith-informed, uh, you know, methodologies of the Quran and the prophetic way, and they're not familiar with the prophetic way of saying things. Okay, uh, the Sunnah is uh, even as the, uh, so. This is looking at harmony, the origins of Quran and Hagarism, for example. This book that may have mentioned this the hadith of zamzam is authentic okay number one both by in terms of its its text as well as transmission al-bushri in zawaid ibn majah and imam nawwi declared its chain of transmission weak but a number of other hadith masters said it is fair hasan narration due to the number of its chains meaning so many people are saying the same thing that it couldn't be a forgery. Let me explain this, what that means, okay? We are living in a time where there's no internet, there's no, you know, WhatsApp, where you can make things up. So if people in Medina are saying the Prophet said something, and the people in uh, Kufa are saying the Prophet said this exact same words, and the people in Damascus are saying the Prophet said this, even though those particular narrations individually may be weak, because only one person is narrating them in each of the three instances. But they're all three saying the same thing. And so it becomes authentic, more authentic, you can say. But other people had a criteria saying, no, if, you know, if there is something the prophet said and there's less than three people saying it, they wouldn't consider it as authentic. Okay. So narration to a number of its chains, definitely sahih as a morsal narration. Some of them, uh, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Hajar, as reported by Suyuti and uh, Al-Munawi, while uh, Mundhari and uh, Dimyati, Ibn Hajar in his monograph on this hadith, and Suyuti uh, declared it sahih. As Sindhi said, the people of knowledge have experienced its veracity. So the other thing that to keep in mind when it comes to hadith literature is what? Is that they're not just theoretical things, they're things that people put into practice and can see and verify from what the Prophet said if it is true or not. Okay? So, so for example, uh, we were with Sufyan Uyayna, Rahimullah, when a man came and asked him, Abu Muhammad, is the hadith you told us about Zamzam water true? He replied, yes. The man said, I drank it for a purpose that you narrate to me a hundred narrations of the Prophet. Ibn Uyayna said, sit, and he narrated to him a hundred hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning proving that it's true. Ibn Asakir narrated that uh, Khatib first drank Zamzam water. He asked Allah uh, Most High three petitions to be able to narrate the history of Baghdad in the city, to dictate hadiths in the mosque of Mansur, and be buried near Bishr al-Hafi, he obtained all three. So there were instances where you can verify the hadith by the spiritual effect it was having on the people. Okay, And that is another thing that, of course, the Orientalists and the people that are studying in Western academia would have no idea about this aspect of hadith verification. Another application of the copycat effect is, is the transferal of praise or disparagement of hadith to produce the effect desired by the forger. As in taking this sound hadith, the Prophet said, a man will come out of this craig who will belong to the people of paradise. Okay. Whereupon Abdullah bin Salam 
uh, Abdullah bin Salam said, the Prophet said, whoever comes here, out from here, will be going to Jannah. And they saw Abdullah bin Salam, okay, radiallahu anhu. A man who comes from Ansar, uh, a, a man from the Ansar came out, transforming it into a man who, a man will come out of this uh, uh, crag or this place who is out of Islam. And then they saw Muawiyah. So these are because Muawiyah was in, in, in opposition to Ali. And so narrations were made to uh, downplay the uh, the um, the role of someone that they didn't like politically. In this case, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Nonsense. The report do not so the the report do not eat pumpkins before you slaughter it. Is clearly a forgery because it does not make sense. Okay. In their respective discussions of the basis on which the lone narrated reports may be rejected, so besides the fact that only one person even said this. Al-Khatib and Shirazi said, when a trustworthy and most reliable narrator relates a report with unbroken chain of transmission, it can be rejected because of certain reasons, among them its contradiction of rational imperatives. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the Aqal, okay, and so this is a very important question. Does Aqal take precedence over hadith literature because the aql has to decide if it's true or not and so do you take your your so according to ibn Habba, you know some of the scholars yes you have to consider the text and if the text makes sense or not in your accepting or rejecting but you have to also know the spirit of islam the nur of islam you have to have that iman that if it of it that the reason for rejecting it is not other reasons right it's actually because the hadith would be questionable or go against the Quran. When it does, its falsehood is ascertained since the law brings up only what human minds deem possible. And certainly not irrationality. Okay, uh, another group of narrations. Uh, gross exaggeration, extravagant bra praise or blame. You find this in hadith literature all the time. Disproportional rewards or punishment are mentioned in such reports as the night watch in the way of Allah is better than one's fasting, praying uh, among one's kins for a thousand years each year, 360 days each day, like a thousand years. Dahabi observed how fantastic, if true, this would mean a total of 360 million years. Uh, another narration, praying with a turban equals 10,000 good deeds. Another narration, one prayer with a ring on one's finger equals 70 without. Okay. Uh, and then like this, okay. Whoever plays chess is cursed as the one who dips his hand in swine's blood. Okay. Uh, whoever says there's no God but Allah, Allah will create from his utterance a bird with 70,000 tongues, each tongue speaking 70,000 languages, all asking Allah to forgive him. Whoever does this, that shall be given in paradise 70,000 cities, and each city 7,000 palaces, and each palace 70,000 virgins. Okay, so these are like exaggerations attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, which are clearly forgeries. Whoever smokes it is as if he drank the blood of prophets, okay, for, uh, fornicated with his own mother inside the Ka'bah. So is the prophet going to say something like, oh, if you did this, it's like you fornicated with your own mother in the Ka'bah? Of course not. So even the language can tell you a lot about what is, uh, so gross exaggeration can similarly be observed in Al-Hakim's report that when Ali radiallahu reached the fort of Khaybar, he unhinged one of its gates and threw it on the ground. Later, 70 men gathered to put it back with the greatest difficulty. Extravagant praise or blame can be for a tribe, a person. Uh, so, for example, uh, the narration, My daughter Fatima is pure and purified. No trace of blood can be seen from her, whether of menses or in giving birth. So, you know, this is kind of like an exaggeration that is not appreciated amongst uh, especially the Muhaddisin. Locality, time, such as reports emphasizing the month of Rajab, compiled by Ibn Dahya Diyya in his monograph, and so on and so forth. Okay, Or 
uh, cheese is a disease and walnuts a cure. Okay, the best of you after 200 years are life, uh, wifeless and childless. School teachers, the worst of you are those who teach young people. These are all things attributed to the Prophet, which we would never hear about today because uh, we know it's not true. And this is why one important point I want to make that is very, very important, that uh, this is why it's important to have books like Riyadh al-Salihin or Mishkat al-Masabi or Zayad al-Talibin, books that have absolutely verified narrations. And this is where the importance of the six, especially the authentic Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, Nisai, uh, these books uh, are like you could say the especially for the scholars these six are very important because they really focus on more authentic narrations uh, compared to some of the other books and uh, especially uh, books that scholars have gathered like Imam Nawi uh, Riyad al-Salihin they give you a better idea of the prophetic uh, way of speaking rather than reading a book that has a mixture, right? Where people would just get confused. Uh, so, so anachronism uh, 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 is detectable in many false false reports, okay? Which means that you're saying something happened at a time where it didn't happen. That's what that means, okay? So, um, so for example, uh, Ibn Malik bin Marwan was, you know, in the presence of Urwa bin Zubair, that Allah said to the rock of Al-Quds, you are my Lord throne, whereas Abdullah bin Marwan was not caliph until 65, year 65, more than 30 years after the Ka'b the Ka bin Ahbar's death, okay? Ka'b bin Ahbar mentioning this, so he's mentioning something in front of someone who didn't even exist at that time. That's the point being mentioned here. Uh, racialism. Racialism gives way to, uh, you know, asabiyah uh, or Arab Arabophobic forgeries, such as better Turks uh, injustice than the justice of the Arabs. Uh, when Allah wants a matter of clemen clemency. He reveals it to the nearest angel of Dari Persia. Okay. And when he wants a matter of punishment, he reveals it to the Arabs. Okay. And so this type of, uh, of course, these are things the Prophet would never say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But these are things that because there was such a strong, and this is the part that now with end times, maybe people understand a little bit better. There was such a strong movement to change what the Prophet said, to discredit him, to that the Hadith sciences had to be made. The Hadith sciences had to be made in order to fend off because things like this were being said. And so the Hadith sciences had to be made in order to know what the Prophet... Because let's say we never considered, uh, and especially for Qur'ani Yun, they must consider that, uh, you know, people were going to make up false reports about the Prophet. So there had to be a science to detect the false reports. Okay, so it's not even, 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 even the Hadith sciences as a science, even if you say that, uh, you know, we don't need Hadith. But still it is important as a part of history to be able to detect what the Prophet did not say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what has been falsely attributed to him, because the public will believe it. Unless you prove that the Prophet didn't say it. And so it, it hurts his credibility. So there had to be a mechanism to protect his credibility. And so this is where the Hadith sciences come in. So for example, somebody attributing to the Prophet, uh, you know, uh, words that sound literary, but they're, they don't have, cl they're not classical and they're not prophetic. But they sound literary. They have they have seem to have some literary merit, right? But uh, they are actually uh, they're not prophetic. So, for example, Sharia is my words, Tariqa is my actions, Hakika is my state, Marifa is my capital, Aql is the basis of my deen. Sounds like good words, but it's not something the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so another example I want to give is Jibreel refused to shake the Prophet's hand and said, you shook hands with the Jew, whereupon he made ablution. Okay. So the Prophet made ablution because he uh, shaked the hands of a, a Jew, Jewish person. So this type of stuff that people were mentioning uh, had to be clarified. So, um, so example of things that have like a literary aspect to it, but they don't have prophetic aspect to it are sayings. And this is one of the ways is called the Saj, okay, uh, or the Saj. There is no body, no jasad that is devoid of hasad, okay. And there's no jasad devoid of hasad. So jasad and hasad, they like rhyme, right? Uh, so zahma is rahma. Okay, like this. The crowd is a mercy. Where there's a crowd, there's mercy. Okay. Uh, bitna, meaning gluttony, eating too much, banishes fitna. Okay. So, you know, bitna and fitna. So this type of language, actually, the Prophet never used, but people used it to, sh to, to say the Prophet said something. It shows literary merit, but has no, has no prophetic spirit in, in those narrations. Like, for example, the first man, awalu nasi, and nas means people, nasi also means to forget. So, uh, awalu nasi, right, was awalu nasi, right? So he was the first to forget. The first of the people were the first to forget. Sounds like interesting wordplay or literary wordplay is there, but it doesn't have the prophetic uh, saying or the prophetic spirit in it. And especially very, very, very careful that uh, where there is fitna, there is chance of hadith forgery. So like the fitna that happened with Uthman. So for example, uh, Uthman radiallahu anh reportedly climbed the pulpit and said, Alhamdulillah, and became tongue-tied and said, Truly Abu Bakr and Umar prepared an appropriate discourse for this setting, but you are more in need of a leader, meaning me, that acts much uh, much than a leader, okay. Uh, that's you need somebody who acts like a leader, like me, basically. Then somebody who speaks well, like Abu Bakr and Omar. So this is to put Uthman up and Abu Bakr and Omar down, and uh, an orator uh, shall come to you later. I ask Allah forgiveness for me and for you. And then he climbed down and led them in prayer, okay. And then uh, Ibn Humam asserts this story is unknown in the books of Hadith and found only in the books of jurisprudence. Okay, meaning some books of jurisprudence may have this story in it, but uh, uh, and then the author says although Ibn Sa'ad and others did narrate this. Okay, but the point is is that this cannot be true because these are not things who Allah has praised, uh, people that Allah has praised, the companions of the Prophet Allah has praised that. فَإِنْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا Allah is happy with them and they're happy with Allah. They can't act in, uh, they can't act in opposition to what Allah has praised them for. So now, you know, uh, let's say 200, 300 years have passed away and now somebody brings up a narration that they didn't even hear about in the past two, 300 years. So about this Imam, uh, Bihaqi, he says, the hadiths which have been established as sound or fall between soundness and sickness have been recorded and written down in comprehensive collections which the hadith experts compiled. It is not conceivable that any of these hadiths escaped the attention of all these authorities. Even if it is possible that some of these hadiths did escape the attention of some of the authorities because of the guarantee of the lawgiver that they would be preserved. So today, when somebody brings a hadith unknown to all of these authorities, meaning all of the major Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, you're mentioning something that was not mentioned in the early days of Islam, and now you're mentioning the Prophet said this. So that would be another uh, very big uh, issue, okay? So Fakhruddin Ar-Razi lists a fourth kind of narrations known with certainty to be untrue and baseless. What is narrated at the time when reports have already become established and when research is nowhere to be found in the books or in the memories of the narrator, such a narration is known to be baseless. As Sayyuti said, as for now, we rely on the books composed on, on that topic 
So whoever comes up with the hadith nowhere to be found in them, the latter rejected it. Okay. So for example, um, let me just give you an example of that. So for example, people in Medina were with the Prophet. And now as Islam spreads, now from these new Muslims, they're hearing the Prophet said this and the Prophet said this. They're like, no, we never heard that. Right. So there is this like, as the hadith, as people became Muslim, narrations are coming back to the main city, Medina, and Kufa for that matter, because these are the two places where the Islamic Caliphate uh, existed at, under the under the companions of the Prophet, uh, under Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, it was in Medina, and then under Ali, it was in Kufa. When these people, I mean, thousands of companions of the Prophet went to Kufa, that's where their Hafs bin Asim, the main Qira'a of Quran, also comes from Kufa. And so these two places, Medina and Kufa, are very, very important in Hadith literature. Okay, and so if people of Kufa never heard a Hadith, and the people of Medina never heard a Hadith, then you know it's very, very questionable. So this is something very important. Now let's narrate or mention some people who were known for forgeries. Abba bin Jafar al Basri reputedly forged more than 300 hadiths which he claimed Abu Hanifa had narrated. Okay. Abdurrahim bin Habim of Faryabi. He systematically forged narrations. He then related from trustworthy figures up to 500 according according to Ibn Habban. Okay. Uh, Abu Asma, Abu Mikyas uh, narrated close to 100 narrations. These people had no shame. Amr bin Azhar al-Basari, uh, the Qadi of Jurjan, was also called the arch liar and forged. Whoever fa fasts three days in Rajab, Allah shall record for him a fast for the whole month, among others. Okay. Uh, Asram bin Ahshab, the Qadi of Hamdan, attributed forgeries to trustworthy narrations. Okay, so there was a conspiracy against Islam from the very beginning, and because of the Hadith literature, we don't have to read these forgeries anymore. Because of the Hadith literature, otherwise, these things that the Prophet didn't say would be common, and we would be saying the Prophet maybe did say this, and you'll see how how ugly this gets as I get uh, deeper into this. Abu Khalil Bazi bin Hussein is responsible for the pseudo report from Aisha that the Prophet used to pray in a pot where Hassan and Hussein urinated and then she told him and he supposedly replied fair little one this uh, statement wherever the prophet says to Aisha Yahumira some of these narrations that have this particular word in it Yahumira oh, oh fair one this kind of like nickname the prophet gave Aisha which was his endearment to her and he did but people would use this in fabricating hadiths do you not know that whenever a servant uh, prostrates to Allah, Allah purifies the spot of his prostration to the depths of seven earths? So, like, he made up these types of narrations, okay? Da'ud bin Muhabr forged hadith narr 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 narrates in his Kitab al-Aql, among them the sayings of Umar, the death of a thousand devotees who spent their night praying and their days fasting is surely lighter on the angel on the death of a single wise person. So somebody said this and they attributed it to the Prophet. Okay. Uh, Abu Naim called him a notorious arch forger, this guy, Al Firyanani. Okay. Uh, Ghulam Khalil. Okay. Same thing. Al Hakim bin Abdullah. Imam Ahmad said of him, all his hadiths are forged. Abu uh, Umair bin Harith. Uh, okay. Uh, all of these big uh, muhaddisin said he's a liar, right? Um, Ibn, uh, Ibn Jawzi added, uh, so it, the, the other person is uh, Al-Hasan bin Ali al zakariya al-Salih, okay, was a declared forger and a liar by Dar qutni and uh, Muhammad bin Hasan. Uh, and then Ibn Abi Awja, okay, uh, was seized by the authorities. He boasted having forged 4,000 hadiths, making the licit illicit. So do you get this, what's happening? People, uh, this person forged 4,000 sayings of the Prophet falsely in order to make halal haram and haram halal. 
ibn Jahdam, okay? Abu Hassan uh, Ali bin Abdullah Jahdam forged a long report describing the modality of the prayer specific to the first night of the month of Rajab, naming it Salatul Raghab, opening it with some words from another hadith. Rajab is the month of Allah, Sha'ban is my month, Ramadan is the month of my community. Okay, etc., etc. So, uh, Ibn Miswar, he used to forge prophetic hadith and took care to forge only sayings containing high moral and, you know, uh, to show zuhud uh, and claiming that there's reward in it. Ibn Rufa'a, okay, uh, same thing. Uh, and then you have Ibn uh, Salt. Ibn Adi, uh, sorry, Ibn Shuja'a, uh, the bizarre report, Allah created a horse, then created himself from the sweat of that horse, which was then purveyed by the Hanbali, anthrop and then, you know. So anyway, so a, a person narrated, the Prophet said, Allah created a horse, and then Allah created himself from the sweat of that horse. Of course, these are uh, silly. Uh, you know, somebody who's never heard these narrations of the Prophet because these people put in the work. The people of the Hadith sciences put in the work. You don't have to hear this nonsense today. And that's why I'm trying to establish the fact that as important as it was to know what the Prophet did not say, then therefore it is just as important to know what he did say so that you can see because you have to know uh, the prophetic way of speaking. You have to know the prophetic idioms, the prophetic expressions, the prophetic style of talking. And to be able to have that, you can say, basira or that nur, or to get used to that type of talking, that uh, the people of the, of the early generations had to know that. They had to do that. They had to know that in order to know what is forgery versus what is not forgery. But the point here is so much work was done on forgeries that why did they do that? They did this because they wanted to preserve the deen and they wanted to preserve the sayings of the Prophet as you have in Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, and Mazi ibn Majah that the Prophet did say these things but he did not say these things and have both on record. Okay. But over here, the other thing that I want to mention is that it's important to keep in mind that there's been a conspiracy in Hadith literature against Islam and Muslims and the Prophet, especially when it comes to end of times. But I'm going to come to that in a second. Ja'far bin Zubair, Shu'ba denounced him as having forged 400 hadiths falsely attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Juwaybari, okay, uh, Ibn Jawzi in his uh, uh, Mawdat quoted master, uh, hadith master Sahal bin Sahri saying uh, uh, Ahmad bin Abdullah Jawabari, right, uh, as the liar par excellence. Okay, he attributed more than 10,000 false sayings to the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, and then the uh, hush shab, justice for a moment is uh, uh, justice for a moment is better than 60 years of worship is considered the creation of the Egyptian ark liar Muhammad bin Isa uh, hush shab uh, Tanisi. Okay. And so you have Muhammad bin Yunus denounced by Ibn Habban as having forged perhaps more than a thousand sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Makki bin Bundar, okay, accused of forging uh, the, the Prophet saying the rose was created from the Prophet's sweat and from the Barak's sweat, okay. Maysara bin uh, uh, Abdur Rabah when uh, Ibn Mahdi asked him about the unheard of hadith he heard him narrating uh, May Sara replied I forged them in order to encourage people to do good so this is how shaitan was tricking the people he confessed on his deathbed this guy 
Mullah bin uh, Abdurrahman Wasati confessed in his deathbed to have forged 70,000 hadiths exalting high merits of Ali. Okay, so this is again a political thing. Uh, Muhammad bin Jafar Huzaya forged a book on Abu Hanifa's canonical reading which Dar al-Qutni declared as baseless as mentioned by Dahabi in his Mizan. Muhammad bin Saad uh, Musloob uh, uh, Shami at Damashqi had a hundred different names by which 4,000 forgeries were propagated. He actually stated there is no harm if it is a nice saying to make up a chain of transmission for it. Okay, Musa uh, Ta'wil is deemed responsible for the forgery. There is, uh, there is in paradise a river named Rajab, which he claimed to narrate from Anas, denounced by Ibn Habban and Ibn Dihya. Uh, again, uh, Nubat bin Shurat is one of the famous forgers. Okay, uh, and you get the point. Nuh bin Abi Maryam declared a liar by Ibn Mubarak, Ibn Habban, and thoroughly shunned narrator by Bukhari Muslim Dar Qutni. He admitted forging a long series of hadiths on the merits of each surah to promote people to read Quran instead of the fiqh of Abu Hanifa and the Maghazi, the Maghazi of Ibn Ishaq. Ratan al Hindi, the brazen. Uh, Indian arch liar uh, claimed that he was 660 uh, year old. He met uh, that he that he he claimed he was 660 uh, year old companion of the Prophet. Narrated forgeries among them. A drop from a scholar's inkwell is dearer to Allah than the sweat of 100 garments of the Shahada. He was exposed by the Habi and others, but sadly, some scholars still cite him. Okay, um, another row al wutaf the prayer must be repeated if the surface of the filth of one's person's clothes or prayer spot equals a dirham. Okay, this is actually a, a statement of Islamic jurisprudence, not something the Prophet said. Uh, Rawandiya bin Muhammad uh, suspected of forgery to look at a beautiful face is to worship. Saad bin Ta'arif, uh, he was so upset at a school teacher who had beaten his son that he forged, the worst of you are those who teach young people. Okay, Salim bin Isa, uh, okay, and uh, an unknown hadith narrator, yet he alone relates with a chain of transmission from Aisha that the Prophet said the most abhorrent of servants of Allah is he whose two garments are better than his deeds and his garments are the garments of the Prophet, while his deeds are the de deeds of tyrants. Right? Even though some of these may be good sayings, but they can't be attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another one, uh, uh, he invented, I saw uh, this As-Sahri bin Asim. Okay? He invented, I saw around the throne a rose on which was written, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, and Allah as an angel of sapphire on top of emerald daily fixing market prices okay uh, and so here it continues these people all these people who have uh, who have lied on the Prophet and we wouldn't know any better had there been no science of hadith so there were a lot of these semi shaykh storytellers Ibn Jawziya says in his book you might hear from them say the rankest lies and I myself am astonished. My ears can hardly believe what they hear from, meaning what you hear from people on in the name of the Prophet, what they would say. When the storyteller Abu uh, Fatuh uh, As uh, Farani came to Baghdad and began to preach, he narrated that the Prophet said, وسلم, I woke up dal, meaning in error. In, uh, among Dalin, I was astray amongst those who were astray, and I was blind amongst the people that were blind. The Prophet said this about himself, according to this storyteller. The court of justice was called into session because he said this. He was brought to court, okay, and a jurist attended. And the teacher of Nazamiya, Ibn Salman, said, They said, Look, dude, you know, if Shafi himself narrated this, if even Imam Shafi had said this, what you're saying, 
right? We would never accept it. After which Abu Fatuh was barred from public speech. Now imagine these thousands and thousands of, you know, tens of thousands of narrations that are all forged if there had been no science of hadith and the good and the bad would be mixed and there would be no criteria, no record of knowing what, no method of knowing what is true or what is false, how would that make the Qur'an look? You know, that this person who came up with the Qur'an, إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are in the highest caliber of character, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, is the, is, he is the rahma, he is the mercy of Allah to all of mankind. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةُ الْحَسَنَةِ Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, is the best of examples. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ Say, if you love Allah, follow me. Right? So, all of these, these sayings in the Qur'an, the Qur'an would come under question. The Qur'an would come under question that the Qur'an is saying, follow this man, and now look at what he's been saying. And look at the things that he doesn't sound like a prophet at all. So had there not been the hadith sciences, everything would have been under a big question mark. It's only because there are hadith sciences and people spent their entire lives trying to build criterias and going through history, you know, bit by bit with the utmost scrutiny uh, to be able to uh, separate the good from the bad. Uh, Ibn Hayyan said in his commentary of the Quran entitled uh, Al-Bahrul Muhit, they introduce themselves as Shaykh and wear the clothes that the general public associates with piety. They do not work for a living, but gather to themselves servants who draw people to them so that they too may serve them and to fleece them of their possessions. Those servants publicize their miracles. They insist on the abandonment of learning, claiming that the way of Allah consists in whatever they themselves decide of seclusions and invocations which are not in the sunnah. Okay, And they enthrone themselves on their uh, you know, their carpets and for their hands to be kissed and they claim to have knowledge which other people don't and so these so-called shayukh they invented lies and they invented sayings, right? So, now uh, let's talk about the different types of forgeries in terms of location. People of Iraq exclaimed Aisha radiallahu anha the people of Syria, Palestine are better than you. A very large number of companions of the Messenger of Allah went out to them, after which they narrated to us, meaning when people from those lands of Palestine, Sham, Syria, when they would come to us in Medina, they would, you know, this is Medina. They would narrate the Prophet such and such, and they would pray in, in according to the Hadith, and they would do things according to the Hadith of the Prophet. So Aisha is saying, radiallahu anha, the people of Syria, Palestine are better than you. A very large number of companions of the Prophet of Allah went out to them after which they narrated to us what we knew. But a small number of his companions went out to you, meaning uh, the people of Iraq. Okay, a small number of people, and this is the exception of Kufa and Basra. Okay, so they, uh, the companions went to Iraq, and what happened as a result? small number of his companions went out to you, after which you narrated to us what we knew and what we did not know. Meaning you're saying things that we never heard and we were with the Prophet. Okay, we heard things from you. Yes, the Prophet did say this. We also heard other things the Prophet didn't say. Among the people of Iraq, says Abdullah bin Amr bin As, are a folk that lie and lie and mock. Were it not for, uh, you know, hadith to come to us from the east, we would find it strange and do not recognize. We would never, ha we, we would have never written a single hadith nor, nor followed its writing. As Zuhri adding, when you hear a hadith from an Iraqi, let him repeat it to you, then let him repeat it to you again. Malik advised, treat their reports like those of the Jews and the Christians, neither believe nor disbelieve them. Ibn Mahdi boasted that in Iraq, 400 Hadith could be heard in one day, not 40 as in Medina. Meaning what? There's so many hadiths that are forged. In Medina, you'd hear 40 hadiths a day, that's enough. Because the, the, how much could the Prophet possibly have said? Meaning from, from the, the macro perspective. 
And now you have people narrating 400 hadiths in one go a day, right? So they were obviously like forged is the point. Why should we... Uh, and then uh, Malik said, why should we be the abode of mintage? That is your lot. You all mint at night and spend in the day. Meaning you make up forgeries at night, right? To mint, to bring the people close to you and all. And then you spend in the day. Okay? Uh, I pondered what the Kufiyins had fabricated about the high merits of Ali. So many people in Kufa had especially prayed, because Ali was the Khalifa there. The high in his household, it reached over 300,000 forgeries. 300,000 forgeries, which Ibn Qayyim commented, do not consider it far-fetched. If you were to examine everything they have to that effect, you would find it to be so-and-so. Okay, so there has was a lot of forgery, which you will never hear in your life, because these scholars already did the work. And had these scholars not done the work, had there been no hadith uh, forger, uh, had 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 there been no hadith sciences, those forgeries, what the Prophet said, didn't say, would all question the Quran in the end. Okay. Okay, so let's now uh, go further. Shia forgeries. I'm not going to go into this. But a lot of Shia forgeries. Okay. And then in, in opposition to that, there are those narrations that are anti-Shia, uh, you know, uh, forgeries that then again in basically what forgeries about the the greatness of someone or the forgeries against uh, someone okay uh, and over here let me just show you so you know you have for example some aspects of Nahj al which the Shia have is also forged clearly um, So now, then there's a whole thing about the Shi'i uh, narrations and the forgeries that they have. And then, of course, there's all those narrations that talk about the greatness of Abu Bakr and Umar, also at the level of exaggeration. So we have to be careful of that. And so these are the Shi'a and the anti-Shi'a, uh, you can say, narrations. Anthropomorphic, uh, uh, anthropomorphic making Allah into human being forgeries. When Allah wants to come down to the lowest of heaven, he descends from his throne in person, in, in his person. Okay, so statements like this, of course, this is a type of forgery in Hadith literature. Um, and then there's a lot to say on this alone, right, from which it was made very clear by the Muhaddisin and uh, by um, the scholars of Islam, uh, on doctrinal and madhahib based uh, forgeries like someone trying to praise Imam Shafi so much or someone trying to praise uh, Abu Hanifa so much as if the Prophet had said this right which uh, then again Mulaqari um, Ali uh, also uh, calls into question and then you have Allahumma uh, salli ala Muhammad uh, tafsir forgeries, Israeli report forgeries Okay, and mixing hadiths with Israeli uh, or the Israelite narrations, uh, you have uh, forgeries of uh, Sufi forgeries about uh, abstinence from the world, not being married, like you know, just you can talk about a whole bunch of things in this category that some people promoted that were not correct according to the or it should or it may have been even good ideas but could not be should not be ever attributed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and contradicted many of his other sayings for example man raghiban sunnati falaysa minni who turns away from my sunnah of marriage he's not amongst me and then you have these narrations uh, talking about how good it is or like uh, there's one narration that's a, a forgery that says you know whoever marries after the 2nd century uh, has women and children or wives and children, you know, should not be doing that after a certain amount of time, which contradicts the saying of the Prophet وسلم, that man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Also, you have end time reports. Okay, for example, uh, there is a narration as you, the age of the world is seven thousand years. Okay, so end time reports again. This is one of those you have to always think 
what are the things that shaitan wants to particularly attack when it comes to hadith literature so let me give it to you this way shaitan doesn't like marriage so there's a big attack there there's a big attack on the prophet being a good role model you know on aisha on the prophet they were trying to do this even in the lifetime of the prophet if you look at the events the end time reports right so that we become confused and uh so these things are very very important uh end time reports there's a lot of forgery in that uh aspect of the deen okay and so you have to have a very food forgeries okay you know uh, uh like uh there are whoever eats a bean with its shell allah shall bring out its like of disease from him beef Beef is a disease, although narrated by Al-Hakam, is deemed inauthentic by scholars since it contradicts the Qur'an. Uh, so you have, you know, uh, cheese, eat bread with grapes, for it's the best, uh, for the best fruit is grapes, and the best food is cheese. Okay? Uh, and so these type of uh, statements that the Prophet obviously did not uh, make. Um... Uh, if people uh, eat figs, for if I said a certain hitless fruit came down from paradise, I would say it is a fig. Indeed, it removes hemorrhoids and helps treat gout. Ibn Qayyim questions its authenticity in the prophetic medicine section of Zadul Ma'ad, while Ghumari said it is uh, this is not the prophetic way of speaking in its uh, way. Okay. Whoever eats fish, let him eat dry dates. Eating fish removes jealousy. Okay, uh, and so these types of narrations uh, about eat grapes two by two, for it is more quenching and lighter on the stomach. Okay, uh, wheat pounded with meat. Uh, honey, use honey for by in him in whose hand is my soul. There is no house in which honey is found, but its angels will ask forgiveness for it. If one drinks it, a thousand cures enter his stomach, and a thousand diseases come out. If he dies with honey in him, fire will not touch his skin, and the first bounty to be taken away will be honey, or are both forgeries, right? So somebody wanted to sell a lot of honey, just say things like this. Lentils are blessed by the, by the mouth of seventy prophets. Okay, last in date. So you have these, for example, for melons, for olive oil, for pomegranate. You got all these like rice. Where if rice were a man, he would be gentle among many other forgeries. Salt. When you eat, begin with salt, finish with salt. For truly, salt is cure for many, for seventy diseases. First among them, insanity, leprosy, toothache, uh, stomach ache. So. It doesn't mean the Prophet didn't say something similar to that, but he didn't say this narration, right? So uh, there are some reports the Prophet said some good things. The Lord of your food is salt. It is narrated through a discarded Isa bin Abi Isa uh, al-Hanat. Okay. Uh, so water. Do not drink water. Uh, do not make water the last thing in your meal. It is a chainless forgery. Okay, so you have to be very careful about foods. Again, where does shaitan want to attack you? Foods, right? So medical hygiene sex forgeries, right? Uh, uh, sayings of the Prophet, that's supposed in which the Prophet brought women down. Sayings of the Prophet about food. This is where shaitan attacks, right? The last resort of medicine is, uh, is uh, counterization. Um, Looking at a beautiful face improves eyesight, while looking at an ugly face causes carter, uh, uh, tartar. Okay, so I mean, these are like silly sayings. Uh, dissolve your food with the remembrance of Allah and prayer, and do not sleep on a full stomach lest your heart's pardon was declared a forgery. Okay, it's not that it's not a good point, but it's not what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, none sneezes amongst the people but mercy. Uh, descends upon them and among them uh, will be someone who supplication is answered again 
These are whoever is sodomized seven times, Allah removes his pleasure from his uh, whatever, his private parts. Uh, uh, so you can see from here that there has been a lot of forgeries, especially when it comes to politics, husband and wife, again, about food, right, the end times, uh, and then circumstance, culture, gender, tribal forgeries, nationalistic forgeries, uh, some place is so good or some place is so bad and some time is so good and some time doing dua in such time or giving sadaqah in such time. All these types of things we have to be very, very careful of even though they may have been said from a point of view that is considered like it's it's a good thing like it's it's encouraging good um but it can really go overboard right the miraj of the prophet sallallahu uh, has a lot of forgeries uh, particular professions uh has a lot of uh forgeries right the pro like for example the best trade is linen and the best craft is leather okay uh, the occupation of, of the righteous in my community is sewing. The misers of my community are tailors. Like Imam Ghazali was a tailor. People are all suitable marriage mar matches except a weaver. Okay, or a cupper. Like hijama, a person does hijama. So, these are things the Prophet Wasallam never said. And we wouldn't know if the Prophet said it or didn't say it if there was no hadith sciences. Uh, Ibn, uh, the Abbasids reported that Jibreel came to the Prophet wearing a black tunic, a black tunic, black shoes. So basically like the way the Abbasid empire is, right? Uh, rings. One, one prayer with a ring on one's finger equals 70, 70 without it is a forgery. Okay, trousers. The hadith of the Prophet's purchase of trousers in Abu Huraira's company was declared a forgery. Okay, turbans. Uh, At-Tirmazi's gharib uh, nearish turban worn on top of a cap is a barrier between us and the polytheists. A forger added, for every round one winds around his head, okay, uh, shall be given light up on the day of judgment for that. Okay. That's not to say the Prophet didn't wear turbans, and it's not son of the Prophet to wear. Of course, it is. Uh, turbans are the crowns of the Arabs. Okay, there's an agreement on its extreme weakness, and none declared it as a forgery except the variant turbans are a sign of Muslims, etc., uh, etc. Et wool, wear wool by which you shall be known in the hereafter. And whoever wishes to find the sweetness of faith, let him wear wool, etc., etc. Uh, literary forgeries. We talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, forgeries when it comes to women. Okay, beware of the best women. The reason of women lies. The reason of women lies between her legs. Knowledge is squandered between women's thighs. Three things provide no protection: the world, the sultan, and women. What a fine in. Uh, what a fine in-law the grave is. Allah curse the, the well, anyway, uh, so these are sayings uh, attributed to women from the Prophet that the Prophet never said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay? Uh, and then so many of the, be, be a learned one or a learner or a lover of learning or a follower, but do not be the fi fifth. This is not a hadith, but a saying of, Abu Darda radiallahu who is a companion of the Prophet who said be a learner. It's a good statement but the Prophet didn't say it. Who, at Whatever the Muslim consider good, Allah considers good. This is not a prophetic hadith but a saying of Ibn Mas'ud who is a companion of the Prophet. Uh, a time shall dawn upon the people that they shall pray and gather together in mosques without a single believer among them. Again, the Prophet didn't say this. Amr bin Asr says this, okay? Even though there's an argument that when it has to do with prophecy, no companion of the Prophet will give a prophecy unless he actually heard it from the Prophet. But either way, you get the point. There's a lot of forgeries, and without the Hadith sciences, we wouldn't know. So, for example, the Sultan is the shadow of Allah on earth, okay? Uh, this is, again, one of those forgeries. 
And so, um, I think uh, I've given a good overall view of uh, oh interpolations. So this is uh, these are like honest forgeries, okay. And so I'm not going to go into this right now. Uh, I think this is enough for now. But I want to end by saying uh, this: the 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 forgeries have been discovered, categorized understood and looked into from many different perspectives from the perspective of the ch chain of transmission from the perspective of uh of what the text itself is saying if it if it contradicts other sayings of the prophet or if it contradicts the quran the sayings of the prophet have been uh rigorously looked at in terms of history that in Medina, nothing of some sort was heard. Then they hear about it from a different place. That the Prophet said it, even though they never heard it themselves. They all these ways are ways of verifying what the Prophet sallallahu had said, and it's been identified where the forgeries lie. For example, an exaggeration of a person, or an exaggeration of a, a food, or an exaggeration of uh, a certain. Uh, time right or a certain deed um, so there has been tremendous amount of work that's been done when it comes to forgeries in the hadith literature of the prophet and this is why we have books of riyadh al-salihin today mishkat al-masabi today why we have ziyadat al-talibin today why we have books of hadith that don't have traces of these forgeries and had we not done that, the whole deen would be under question because we wouldn't know who Muhammad is. He would look like a schizophrenic person. Sometimes he says this about women. Sometimes he says this about women. So unless you had a criteria, because whether you agree with hadith or not doesn't matter because people were going to bring up what the Prophet said regardless. And so you, there had to be a hadith science. And that hadith science tells us what the Prophet didn't say as much as it tells us what the Prophet did say. So what I hope by this uh, presentation today uh, is that you have a much greater appreciation for what happened in history, a much greater appreciation for the work the muhaddisin have done. May Allah bless all of them. The great work that the scholars of Islam have put into, into the protection of Islam by having a science like, for example, the science of hadith, where they were able to very, very specifically identify the people, the topics, the words, the uh, the vocabulary used by people that do forgery. Okay, and this all attests to the truthfulness of Islam. Because uh, had there been no science of hadith, uh, you know, Islam would be a question mark. But Islam retains its purity because of transmissions because of asanid because of transmission from one person to another person to another person real human beings real scholars one after the other transmitting the prophetic uh sayings and the prophetic knowledge of the prophet so inshallah pray for me and inshallah i will pray for you and uh if you get a chance please do look into the arabic class that i'll be teaching very soon and you can sign up for that Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.